If you will turn in your Bibles, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, as we continue our study through the Word. Now, you'll remember last time how we took a look at the ministry and the life of Hezekiah, good King Hezekiah, uh, and just how he, he cleansed the temple, he restored temple worship, he pointed the people's hearts back to the Lord, and we saw just the, uh, the tremendous way in which Hezekiah was uh, blessed. And, and now we are going to see, when we come into this 33rd chapter, we are going to see his son's reign. And his son was Manasseh. And, and rather than following in the footsteps of his father, rather than us being able to say, good King Manasseh, uh, we are not able to say that. Uh, Manasseh did not continue to walk in the reforms of Hezekiah. And we see once again how the head leads uh, now. And a good king leads the nation towards God. But, uh, but a bad king, an evil king, a wicked king, we see that, that they lead the nation and they lead the people away from God. And one of the things that that speaks to is the importance of leadership, the importance of headship. And in the construct uh, of the way the Bible has given to us the lines of authority, men are called to be the, the leaders. We are called to be the husbands, the priests, prophets, and the kings. And there is a weight of responsibility of leadership that is upon the shoulders of the men. When men are in the word and they are leading their families and serving their families and blessing their families, we see the blessings of God that are upon them. When we see men abdicating those positions, when they are absent from the leadership or they are poor leaders or they are wicked leaders or evil leaders, we see the marriages and we see the family and we see the children are all going to be pulled down by that. And so the importance that we have of leaders leading, of men being who God has called us to be and stepping up in that capacity. Are we a Hezekiah or are we a, a Manasseh? And ladies, you also are leaders within your spheres as well. You are not the head over the husband or over the family, but you have influence over the children with other women and throughout the areas that God has given you influence to lead as well. The importance of leadership and leading in such a way as to draw others to God and to help assist them in godliness and in righteousness. And so as we continue to see these studies of the kings and king after king after king, and, and that's what really Second Chronicles is all about, is the, is the short course on the kings of Judah, the southern kingdom now. We see the contrast of the leadership and then the blessings or the, the trouble and the calamity that befalls the nation because of the leaders. And so the Bible also reminds us in the New Testament that we're to pray for our leaders in our country. Amen? Because as the leaders go, they are going to influence the nation as well. And so we want to make sure that we are praying for the leaders of our nation as well. And so Manasseh, he is going to rule after Hezekiah. And we see that he comes to the throne early. Look at in verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. So his reign is the longest of any of the kings of Judah. He reigns until he's 67 years old. But, but the thing that strikes me is he comes onto the throne at the age of 12. Can you imagine the leader of the country being 12 years old, uh, you know, and, and what would that look like? But no doubt he had advice 
advisors that were around him and helping and aiding him. And, and that leads to a question also, did he have good advisors around him or did he have wicked advisors that, that became the influencers uh, in his life? We know that Hezekiah was a godly father, was a godly man, but now we see Manasseh, his son, is going to head in a different direction. In verse two it says, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He raised up altars for the Baals and made wooden images, and he worshiped all the host of heaven and served uh, them. And so we see uh, in verse 2, it begins by saying that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's an epitaph that none of us would want uh, on uh, our tombstones. We, we would like the, the legacy that, the, that we leave behind to be and that we did what was right in the eyes uh, of the Lord. And so we have Hezekiah, his son, ascends to power and we see that he does evil in the sight of the Lord. Not only does he himself does he do evil? But we see that he now leads the nation in the evil that he himself is participating in. Remember that Hezekiah had torn down all of the idolatry that was in the land. But now we see here that, that his son goes and rebuilds uh, all of the abominations to God that the father had torn down and had purged. And so it's one thing to do evil yourself. It's another to lead others into evil as well and so we see that it says that that he raised up the altars of Baal these are the old Canaanite gods and so we see that he now is committing spiritual idolatry here we see that he is turning away from God and worshiping the false gods. He worshiped all the host of heaven. So he's worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars and uh, instead of worshiping the one that created all of those things. He is worshiping now the things that he could see with his physical eyes uh, rather than the one who was behind the physical realm that was created. It says in verse 4 that that he also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So the temple, we see that now he moves in and he desecrates the temple. The outer court, the, the court of the women and the court of the men, we see that now he takes and, and he erects uh, in here the altars to the sun and to the moon and to the stars. We see that he built altars in the house of the Lord. Jerusalem is God's uh, holy city. It is an amazing place to be and to visit the presence of God and his fingerprint upon that city. It is amazing to stand in the city of Jerusalem to recognize that from all of the real estate on the face of the earth, that this is the one place that he put his finger and said, this is my city. And within that city itself is one little tiny plot of land, the Temple Mount. And, and there on the Temple Mount, uh, there is a place where he put his finger in the Holy of Holies and said, this is the one place on the face of the earth that will be different than any other place. Because it is here where I will physically and tangibly dwell to meet with my people in my land the Holy of Holies and the temple itself. And we see that his son, now Hezekiah's son, rather than honoring and respecting and worshiping God, we see that he pushes God aside and shoves in the false worship and the idolatry into the very temple of God himself. The temple that Solomon had built and dedicated, and you'll remember how the Shekinah glory came down from heaven and filled the temple. 
to where they couldn't even stay. The priests had to depart. They had to leave and back up because of the presence of God was so thick upon the place. Here we see now building altars to the Canaanite gods who the nation of Israel had been given the land because of the sins of the Canaanites. It had risen up to God and he said that enough, their iniquity has been filled and I will remove them from this land. And now the nation of Israel was given that very land. Here we see that, uh, that now Manasseh is returning back into the ways of the Canaanites there. In verse 6 it says, And he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritists. And he did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And so... We see that there are three valleys. Jerusalem itself, the, the city and the temple in particular, sits between three valleys. There's the Tyropian Valley that is to the west of the city. There is the Eastern Valley, which is the Kidron Valley. And then uh, along the southern border, that is the Valley of Hinnom. And it was there that now Manasseh brings about child sacrifice to Moloch was the God that they would offer their children up to, their unwanted children. And so we see that, uh, that as they were promiscuous and had unwanted children, then they needed a way to dispose of the children that were unwanted. And so he brings about now child sacrifice. He is involved in witchcraft and, uh, and sorcery and consulting medium and spirits and and, and we see as we, as we look at this and we say, how wicked is this? And yet, at the same time today, we see that, that there are the psychics that are all around us that you can go to here, the spiritists and the witchcraft that is being practiced. My son and I were in Barnes & Noble the other night, and we were leaving at a book, and there was this gal uh, behind us, and, uh, and she had a very severe haircut on her, and I said, that's some serious hair that you got going on uh, to her, and, uh, and we got outside, and my son said, to, did you notice what she was buying, what was underneath her arm, and I, and I said, no, and he says, she was buying a Ouija board. We, I'm like, they still have those, you know, but, but here, what was she doing? I mean, what is that? That is about trying to connect with the occult uh, and channeling the, uh, the information, the knowledge, and through there. We have the horoscopes that people follow today. They want to know what their lucky numbers are and whether today is going to be a, a good day or a bad day. These are all of the pagan practices now of searching out information relationship apart from God trying to bypass God and to influence life and future and fortune, and all separated and apart from a relationship with God. And so here we see the very same things as that nation turned away from God, the practices that started to, to enter in. We see also in our nation as our nation has turned away from God and is now beginning to slide farther and farther. We see that, that these are the embraces that come in to a nation when it turns its heart and its eyes away from God, then it will embrace everything else. And so verse 7, he even set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name, how long? Forever. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. And so we see that he takes an image now. And it's one thing to put up the altars uh, in the courtyards, but now he goes 
into the temple itself and he constructs some type of an image that is set there. And so we see that this is about as bad as you can possibly get here. And God is not going to uh, allow that to continue. He reminds them here, the Chronicle reminds us that God's blessing was that they would be in the land, but it was a conditional blessing. He would bless them as long as they obeyed and stayed in fellowship and communion with him. But if they broke that, then they would also be removed from the land. It says in verse 9, so Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. What a sad, sad, sad commentary when God's people are conducting themselves, listen, worse than the world. The Canaanites represented of the world who God judged by removing them and placing his bride, his nation, his people into the land we see now as a wicked king rises into that position of authority. His uh, uh, actions and the deeds of the nation now surpass the wickedness even of the Canaanites uh, whom the Lord uh, had removed. And so we see here that, uh, that Manasseh is so evil himself that he causes the people to sin uh, along with him. In verse 10 it says, And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. And therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks and bound him with bronze fetters and carried him off to Babylon. So we see that God is speaking to Manasseh. God is convicting him and trying to draw him out of his sin. And in the same way, God also convicts us of our sin and tries to draw us out of our sin. God is actively working to mold us and to shape us uh, into godly people, to change the character of our lives, uh, to work upon our hearts. And God is speaking to us if we have ears to hear. But here we see that Manasseh doesn't want to hear the voice of God. And I am always reminded of how dangerous it is in a person's life when we hear truth, when God is talking to us and we push that truth away. When God reveals truth to us and we do not respond to the truth that God is revealing, we do that to our own demise in our life. And it, <laughs> it begs the question, is God speaking anything to you that you don't want to listen to, that you don't want to hear? Because when we're doing that, when we don't want to hear what God has to say about something, it means that we're protecting our own will in our life. You remember how Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. And, and when God says, okay, then let me tell you what my will is. And you're like, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear that right now. Because I want to keep on doing what I'm doing right now. I want to keep on doing what I'm doing right now. And that is the battle between the flesh and the spirit. The Spirit is trying to lead us into a surrendered relationship to God. And the flesh is trying to say, just gratify me, just gratify me. And, and, and we can do some of that stuff over there, but let's not get crazy about that over there. And it's always trying to lead us into self. And so when we are trying to protect any area of our life, when we don't want to surrender it to God, we're protecting now what it ultimately is sin in our life remember that the bible tells us that that even if it's not sin if we're convicted on it and we don't respond to it it becomes sin to that person in other words you might have this conviction in your heart that eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is sin <laughs> That's just, you just have that conviction. And then you're like, I am not allowed to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And then no one's around and you're like, oh, there's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And, and you take a bite out of it. Guess what? You just sinned. You just sinned. Because God told you no and you disobeyed. 
And so here we see that, that God was trying to talk to Manasseh. The Holy Spirit convicts us uh, of sin. We have our conscience and we have the, the Holy Spirit that is leading and guiding every single one. And Manasseh didn't want to hear it, didn't want to hear it, didn't want to hear it, didn't want to hear it. Did I say didn't want to hear it? <laughs> he didn't want to hear it. And so when you are a parent and you are pleading with your child and they don't want to hear it, you have no choice. You have to pull out the parent prerogative. <laughs> and that parent prerogative, unfortunately, is inclined to open up their ears to want to hear what you have to say. And so we see that God needs to open up Manasseh's ears. He tried talking, he tried talking, he tried talking, he tried talking. And so now, what does he do? He brings him into captivity. You see, he removes his freedom. He removes the blessings that he has in his life. And he allows the consequences of his actions. You see, disobedience to God is always going to bring us into bondage. Disobedience to God is always going to bring us into bondage. Who the Son sets free is? is free indeed. In Christ, we're free. Freedom is always in God. When we're moving away from God, we're always moving into bondage. And here's the lie of the enemy. The lie of the enemy says that you're actually moving away from repression and into freedom and unshackling you and, and be free. But that's the lie of the enemy. Whenever you are moving away from God, you're moving into bondage. And so here we see that now Manasseh is taken into captivity by the Babylonians, I mean by the Assyrians. You see, the Assyrians were the world power at this time. You remember how the Assyrians had taken the 10 northern tribes and brought them into captivity. But Babylon is on the rise. And what happened is, is that Babylon kind of rebelled uh, against Assyria. And so Assyria and Babylon got into it. And Assyria put, subjugated Babylon once again. And we see that Assyria now comes and Manasseh now, they believed, uh, the Assyrians believed that Manasseh had sided with the Babylonians in that rebellion. Uh, and, and so what they did is they took him into captivity and they brought him to Assyria. And so this was now a consequence uh, to Manasseh in the rebellion uh, against them. And so it says in verse 12, And now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And, re and he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. And so here he is in the captivity and consequences. And what happens? He cries out to God. And let me ask you a question. Is God merciful or what? If we don't believe that God is merciful, all we have to do is to just read this passage right here. He does more evil than the pagans that were in the land. He desecrates the temple. He says he's sorry, and God takes him back. <laughs> and God forgives him and restores him and allows him to come back in. God loves to restore. Amen? God loves to forgive. God is seeking restoration. In fact, the entire Bible is about reconciliation. It's the reconciliation of sinful man with the holy, righteous God. That is what the entire story of redemption is all about. And here is one of the greatest stories of redemption. I know that so oftentimes people say that God could never forgive me of all of my sins. But you want to know, we know that that's not true. But here is the truth. That person can't forgive themselves of their sin. That, that is the issue. And they're placing their own limited ability and capacity to forgive upon God. And they are narrowing God's capacity to their capacity. When the truth is that God is willing to forgive every single one of our sins. That he is a greater savior. Jesus is a greater savior than we are sinner. Amen? And so his capacity to save is greater than our capacity to sin. And I am so thankful for that personally, you know. Thank you, Jesus, you know, for that. And so Manasseh, it's just, it's just almost incomprehensible, the grace of God, that he would just forgive Manasseh and put him right back in as king. But we see that Manasseh has a changed heart. 
that, that this is true repentance, that, that what happened is that God used affliction in his life to open up his eyes and to open up his ears. And once his ears were opened up, he became a changed man. You see, and that's what God wants. God wants open ears. He wants to be able to speak to us. He wants us to be able to hear what he has to say so that he can lead us and he can guide us. I love that, that song that Michael sang about, about being led by God. I want to be led by God. I want him to lead in my life. And so now Manasseh is a man who's willing to be led. It's like the difference between a horse that's wild and a horse that's broken. The horse that will not be ridden and the horse that, that will be ridden. I remember one time the rodeo had its finals here as they do every year and they come to the Thomas and Mac and there was this, this Christian ministry, this guy that he would take a wild horse to right at the end of the rodeo for everybody that wanted to stay. Uh, he took this wild horse and he began to break it right in front uh, of everybody the whole time while he was preaching the gospel. And he was explaining how the horse is afraid. And he's afraid of him, but he doesn't know that, that I mean him good and I don't mean him evil. And the, and the horse was running back and forth and then he built the trust and, the, and he goes through this entire thing of where, and, he, and, he, and in the beginning, all he would do is then, he, he got to the point where he could touch the horse. He got to the point where he could just walk with the horse. But first he had to tire the horse out and so the horse ran and ran and ran and ran. So he just kept the horse running around in circles until it couldn't, hardly run anymore and then it would let him approach him and it's tiredness and he talks about how we run away from God and how you know it's finally at this point that that will allow God near and then you know and he never even gets on it he would just would then put his arm around him and start walking with his arm around him and then he would hop his stomach on and slide back off and then he was able to lay his stomach on keep the horse walk around this whole time never once did he ever get on and overpower the horse he just he just kept on relationally moving to this point and at the end he's preaching the gospel sitting on top of this horse now uh, that he is able to ride you know throughout and it was just this incredibly powerful demonstration of just the way that that God is seeking to to take our hearts and to bring them underneath the will of him so that he can guide us and direct us and and use us now for his glory and for his purposes. And so Manasseh goes from this wild horse and what happens? He suffers affliction and now he's willing to do God's will. And how often times in, in our own lives it, does it take the same thing? Do we suffer affliction in our lives, the consequences of not of not following God's plan and God's wisdom. And, and then when we suffer those consequences, it's, it's like, okay, God, I give up. I'm sorry. Uh, let's do it your way. <laughs> and God says, all right, I was waiting for that all along. Let's, let's get busy and let's get going. And, and that's what he does even with the wickedest king in all of Judah's history. That's what he does with him. And now Manasseh comes back from captivity and he is a changed man. And so uh, it says that then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. And so who is the Lord of your life? Is there still that battle going on? Are you still trying to be the Lord over your own life? Or have you got that settled? Have you gotten to the point now where you are able to get that settled? I'm going to give you a caution right now. If you haven't got that settled, God is going to continue to battle to be the Lord over your life. And if you will not listen, then he will bring affliction into your life to get you to the point where you will also surrender and say, okay, let's do it. Let's do it your way. My prayer for you is that you would use wisdom and just surrender now, you know. I mean, just he, he is God and we are not. Amen? So surrender. <laughs> Verse 14. And after this, he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate and it enclosed Ophel. And he 
raised it to a very great height. And then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. And he took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem. And he cast them out of the city. And so we see, what does he do? He goes and he cleanses his house. He gets his life right. And so all the sin and the things that stumbled him and led him away from God, what does he do? He gets it out uh, of his life. Is there anything in your life that needs to be cast out, that needs to be gotten out? Anything that stumbles you, that you have trouble with, that you try and keep in your house and you keep trying to control it? And God says, just get it out. Get it out of your house. Repent. Get it out of your house. Get your life cleaned up in here. And, and that's what he does. He comes back and just undoes all of the things that, that he had worked to accomplish to build get torn down. And now, what do we see? We see that his life uh, is in harmony with God. Verse 16, he also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Not only does he start worshiping the Lord, what does he do? He commands uh, everybody else to start worshiping as well. And here we see now a leader leading. We see first he had led them away from the Lord, and now he gets turned around. What does he do? He leads everybody back to the Lord here. And nevertheless, though, verse 17, the people still sacrificed on the high places but only to the Lord their God. Now, the people were supposed to worship in the temple and they were supposed to uh, worship in the proper places, but they are worshiping up in the groves. And so we see here, while they did worship God, they did not do it as they had been instructed. And this, again, is part of the consequences uh, uh, of bad leadership. We see that you know when you lead people astray, and then you try and head in a different direction, you're not always able to undo the things and the consequences uh, uh, of our sin. Our sin affects others. Our sin affects others in our lives. In verse 18, now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, indeed they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. And also his prayer and how God received his entreaty and all his sin and trespass and the sites where he built high places and set up wooden images and carved images. Before he was humbled, indeed, they are written among the sayings of Hosea. And so Manasseh rested with his fathers and they buried him in his own house. And then his son Ammon reigned in his place. And so we see that Manasseh uh, goes to be with the Lord. And now his son Ammon reigns in his place. And so here's the question. Does his son follow after the earlier Manasseh or the later Manasseh, the wicked Manasseh or the good king Manasseh. And so uh, we see in verse 21, it says, And Ammon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images with his father Manasseh had made and served them. And so uh, here we see that, that Ammon now follows after the earlier pattern that Manasseh had set in his life. But here is the difference. Manasseh had a time in his life when, when he didn't walk with God and then he had a time in his life when he did walk with God. But the difference is found in verse 23. And he did not humble himself before the Lord. You see, Manasseh was humbled by affliction when he's taken into captivity and he turns his life around. But what happens with Ammon? He never humbles himself. He never humbles himself before the Lord. As his father Manasseh had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. 
And so he becomes wicked, and the people now, they, they have been walking in righteousness. They've seen Manasseh turn around, and now they've been underneath you know, godly leadership. And Ammon comes in, and he is just wicked and evil. So look at what happens. Then his servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. They're like, that's it. We're done. But the people of the land, listen, executed all those who had conspired against the king. King Ammon. And then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. So short reign, two years, his own servants say, we can't stand you anymore. They kill him. And then the people say, no, you are not allowed to take things into your own hand. And so they are executed for the crime. And now what happens is Josiah is going to reign. And so chapter 34, verse 1, Josiah was how old? Eight years old, so 12, if you thought 12 was young. Now we got an eight-year-old uh, on the throne. He is eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, uh, in verse 2. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked uh, in the ways of his father David, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And so here we see that, that that's kind of adding to the scripture or taking away from the scripture. We don't want to add anything and we don't want to be too restrictive. We don't want to restrict what the word of God doesn't restrict. And we don't want to set free what the word of God does not set free. We don't want to turn to the right or to the left of the word of God. We want to stay right on track with the word of God. And so he doesn't turn to the right and or to the left. Verse 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. So at the age of 16, he begins now to seek God, to follow after the Lord. And then the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. And so much like his great-grandfather Hezekiah, we see Josiah loved the Lord and began to demonstrate this actively in his life at 16. And, and by the time that he's 20, he's now initiated uh, a campaign to, to take and to purge uh, the Canaanite religion from the, from the nation. Verse 4, And they broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence. And the incense altars which were above them he cut down. And the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images he broke in pieces and, and made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Look at verse 5. And he also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. He wasn't playing. He, he got serious with uh, now the making his opinion known known uh, and purging the nation here and so uh, it says in verse 6 and so he did in the cities of Manasseh Ephraim and Simeon as far as Naphtali and all around with, with axes and when he had broken down the altars and the wooden images had beaten the carved images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel he returned to Jerusalem exhausted <laughs> it doesn't say that, but that's got to be, you know, that was a lot of pounding and powdering and chopping. And so he ends up now uh, returning to Jerusalem. He was pretty zealous uh, in his cleansing. It's interesting at the time of Passover that the Jews, what they do is that they go through, they take a lamp uh, and they go through their entire house searching for any leaven whatsoever. First of all, they're to clean out every single bit of leaven that is in the house and the purging of the, in fact, spring cleaning, that's where spring cleaning came from, uh, is the cleaning out of, and leaven is representative of sin. It is to go through your household 
and to purge out every single bit of sin that might have creeped into your house during the course of the year. And then the father takes a candle and he goes through the whole house uh, ceremonially looking for any sin that is resident in the house. And then he proclaims the house is clean. Well, this is what Josiah does throughout the whole nation. He goes throughout the whole nation looking for any place where there is leaven in the nation. And now he drives that leaven out. And what does he do now? He returns back to Jerusalem now after having cleansed the land, having examined it. And he says, we're clean now. We're clean. May this Passover, may we go through our houses to the corners and to the nooks and the crannies and say, has the world gotten into our houses this past year? Have we compromised in any area and any standard that there is? And, and if so, then we want to clean that out. If the Lord was to come and to visit your house, would he be pleased? Would you need to say, can you wait outside for five minutes <laughs> and quick fill up your trash bin with certain things that, that you don't want the Lord to see? Then, then may the Lord just move in our hearts and our lives to, to get our homes in a place that's God-honoring, where leaven doesn't reside in our house, where we also are seeking the fullness of the blessing of God in our lives. And that's what Josiah is doing. He is seeking the fullness of God's blessing. He wants no compromise whatsoever in any part of the land. And may our hearts resonate with that. May the Lord be speaking to us tonight here. And so he he returns to Jerusalem. It says, verse 8, And in the 18th year of his reign, so he's 26 years old now, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, uh, Mesaiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites who kept the doors had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and from all the remnant of Israel, from all Judah and Benjamin, and which they had brought back to Jerusalem. And so they now have taken the, the monies that have been brought to uh, the priests. They've collected them and they've brought them back to Jerusalem. And now the temple is in need of repair. It's in need of restoration. But they have the funding to be able to, to do that now. And so verse 10, it says, Then they put it in the hand of the foreman who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen who worked in the house of the Lord to repair and restore the house. And they gave it to the craftsmen and builders to buy hewn stone and timber for beams and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And so uh, a great renovation is going forwards. And verse 12, and the men did the work how? Faithfully, I love that. They did the work faithfully. And may that be the way that we conduct our lives. May we do the things that God calls us to do. May we do them faithfully. May we be found faithful in the things that God calls us. Uh, it says in verse 12, their overseers were Jahath the Obad and Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Merari and Zechariah and Meshelam of the sons of the Kohathites to supervise others of the Levites, all of whom were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and were overseers of all who did work in any kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes, officers, and gatekeepers. So the Levites, these were the ones who were responsible for the, the worship that went on in the nation. They were the overseers to make sure that the things that were taking place in the house of the Lord were taking place properly. Verse 14. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found 
the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And so that would be the Pentateuch or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those five books, the book of the law that was written by Moses. Moses wrote out those first five books. And, and so they come across it. It's stashed now in the, in the treasury. And, and then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. And so Shaphan carried the book to the king bringing the king word, saying all that was committed to your servants they are doing. He's, he's giving them an update on the repair of the temple there. And so he's telling them the temple project's going great. The restoration is happening. We're on budget. We're on schedule. And he says in verse 17, and they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. And then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book and Shaphan read it before the king. And so Shaphan begins to read the word of God to the king. And suddenly the king is undone by the word of God. You see, there was a famine going on in the land for the word of God. As idolatry had come in, the, uh, the scriptures had, uh, had vanished uh, and were gone. And you'll remember how the, the law said that every king was to hand write a, a copy uh, of the scriptures uh, himself uh, uh, and that that was to be his own personal copy. And so now suddenly the word is being read to him and, and apparently he's never heard the word of God before. I can remember that for me the, that this was a similar experience the first time that I stepped foot into a Calvary Chapel. The first time that I heard the Word of God opened up and explained line by line, verse by verse in its context. And I will never forget ever that at the end of service, that when now the book was closed and, and it was Pastor Chuck and Pastor Chuck told everybody, you know, to, uh, to, to rise and to stand, I, I wanted to jump up out of my seat and, and tell everybody, no, everybody sit back down and you keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard anything like this in my entire life. And just the the, the, the ignition in my heart over the word of God and w that I could understand the word of God and that God wanted us to understand the word of God and that the word of God was a gift to us and that the word of God is, uh, is love letters that he wrote to us for us to understand him and how much he loves us and and the way that you treasure love letters and you keep them and you save them and you reread them and you memorize them and, and all. And, and that was the treasure that God had given to us, the word of God. And here is now Josiah suddenly hearing the word of God in, in his life. And, and what it brought in Josiah was conviction instantaneous conviction as the king who was responsible for the covenant with God's people, suddenly he realizes that he has not been a covenant-keeping king. And there is this tremendous conviction that falls upon him. And look, verse 19, And thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes, the royal clothes he tore, and then the king commanded Hilkiah and uh, Ahakim, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and uh, Asaiah, the servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for those who are left in Israel and Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. He was concerned that now God's wrath was going to come because the nation had not been obeying God's word. So Hilkiah and those the king had appointed went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke to her to that effect. 
And then she answered them. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. That's Josiah. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants and all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands and therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. And so she tells them that God is going to bring his judgment upon the land according to God's word, that God said it, he meant it, and he is going to follow through on it. But, verse 26, as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. And surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. And so they brought back word to the king. And though the wrath was going to come on the nation, Josiah was not going to happen in Josiah's lifetime. And so we see what Josiah's response is. It says, Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah in Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. And then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And so before the people, he he makes a covenant before God that he is going to live righteously according to the word of God and made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. And so the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And it reminds me of Joshua as Joshua is standing there before the people and he says, Choose ye this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now you take a stand. Where do you stand? Whose side are you on? Will you side with me and will you come and serve the Lord? And that's what this godly man does now as the king. He repents. He realizes that he has not been living righteously because he didn't know. It was out of ignorance. And when he discovers his sin, he weeps over it. And he, he now goes and seeks in God's face. And, and now we see that he makes a covenant before God publicly. He stands up and declares who he is and where he is as a man of God. And then he invites them to make a stand as well. And so the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. In verse 33, thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. I wish that we could do that, that we could make uh, uh, everybody diligently serve the Lord uh, uh, their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. May that be true in our houses, in our marriages, in our homes, with our children, and with our families. And may a mighty work of God begin inside each and every one of us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And God, maybe we've never heard your word declared in its context and before. And, and Lord, May we also have that response like Josiah of, God, what shall we do? What shall we do? And so, Father, would you minister to each and every one of us? Bless us and lead us and guide us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.